Hello, everybody. I'm just a boring banker. <laughs> it's me between. It's it's my speech is between drinks and the fun that will happen after. So I was thinking when I was coming to Iceland today. It's my first time actually here. I've seen the world three times over. I've been to many places um, over the last 20 years to understand two things. One is how the financial industry can invest in sustainable businesses to contribute to sustainable development. And the second was to understand what is the true impact of sustainability on the people and billions of people around the world that we invest in every day. What is the sort of the true power of the financial sector? And some of the lessons I've learned after 20 years is that financial industry and financial sector, you can call it for whatever you want, but it has this fantastic engine in itself that is very often misused, but can be used for good things. And if used properly, this toolbox can be used for fantastic things. We can actually contribute to something that we haven't seen before. And I will talk about that today. I have 20 minutes. Drinks are waiting. I'm sure you're going to have fun. And we can start before I show you a short film. I did a short film before I came here today because I was sitting with a couple of my colleagues and thinking, so how shall I sort of transform the feeling? What are we really fighting for? And I did a short film. But before I show you the film, I would like you, I would like six people in the audience, randomly, to stand up. Randomly, six people. Just, I'm not going to do anything nasty. I promise. Can I see the six people? Okay, nobody's daring to stand up. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. Great. Six people in the world own more money than one billion people living on this planet. I hope it's you. <laughs> and I wish you all the best. Please sit down. So I'll show you the film. And then we start talk about something that is, nobody has talked about today, and that is that the financial system, the economic model that we use, is crap. It's not sustainable, and we need to do something about it. But let's have a look at the film. make you feel? <laughs> this is the world that we want to prevail, we want to keep, we're going to develop. But the problem is when you see this, you get the goosebumps and all of that, but it's all about money. You get a bit sort of a cynical about it. I will explain why. I'll take you around the world in 20 minutes. So we start with Asia. A couple of years ago, I had the privilege to listen to the Chinese Prime Minister in a place called Dalian, bordered to North Korea. He was standing on a stage like I'm standing today, and he spoke to the people from World Economic Forum from all over the world, the closed session, and he started his speech by saying, next hundred years, this is what we want. This is the vision, this is the mission, this is where we're going. 
the guy next to me from Belgium, behind me from France, we were looking at each other and, and sort of a, being a bit scared. Next hundred years? When did you hear anybody in Europe talk about next hundred years? Then I went to Africa, and I traveled throughout the East Africa to visit businesses, mining companies, investors, private equity investors, to understand how the sustainability aspects are impacting the way they operate. The roads and, and the signs on the roads in Eastern Africa are in Chinese. Do you know that? 33% of the world population will be living in two countries, India and China. One third is going to be a lot of numbers. So one third of everybody living in Northern Europe, including Iceland, in 2030 will be over 65 years old. So where do you think the growth, potential development of the company, solutions will be taking place? Will it be in Europe, which is old and tired, or in Asia? And what's going to happen in Africa? This is a resource pool we have. Nobody's talking about that, but the Chinese are very smart. They've been doing this for the last 25 years. 70% of all agricultural land in Eastern Africa is bilaterally owned by Chinese government. Because they need food. Because they will grow. They will expand. So what has this to do with us, with the business, with the investments? So I am sorry to say, but you know, the sustainability, and we talk a lot about the climate. I'll explain from a financial point, when we look at the climate right now, what are we facing? Imagine that you buy a pair of shoes that are two sizes too small, and you try to wear them every day. That is how we're trying to fit the climate into the financial modeling that we have today. We are struggling with the fact that the, we knew for a number of years that externalities like nature, environment, social issues are not priced in into price of the companies, businesses, in gross domestic product calculations and all of these things. And now, when the emperor is not only naked, but it's in the water up to the knees, we are trying to figure out how we're going to fit this. Somebody mentioned the clouds. The climate is just a cloud. The big storm coming after is probably a storm related to things like just transition. How are we going to grow together? I'll tell you a story, which is a very telling story. I visited India many times. Last time I was in India, I visited a place where a family of seven people was saving money for 12 years to buy a small car which is driven by two tacked engines, you know, the old ones, that are very sort of a diesel intensive. They were saving the money, and the mother was saving the money for the kids to go to school and to buy the car so they can actually do visit their relatives and all of these things. And the car was delivered to them in front of the house in a package. And we were there. Imagine, 1.3 billion people in India. Everybody wants to have transportation, cars, all of these things. And they got the car, and after unpacking the car, they were getting into the car, and they wanted to drive away. Seven people in a small car. It's not bigger than this. It's very small. And I was thinking, you know, we were so happy to see this family. And in the same time, in the same moment when we were looking at this, I was thinking, oh my God, imagine that these people should actually not use these cars, not this technology. But who are we to tell them that they are not allowed to do that? Let me give you some numbers. How many cars are produced, sold in China every year? Any numbers? Anybody? It's like Sotheby's. We can have a bidding. 28 million. How many of these cars are electric or hybrid cars every year? Right now, it's 1.2 million. In the US, it's much smaller. Why am you what, what is the reason that I'm telling you about the numbers? The reason is that we actually don't see, we are not trying to understand what the causes of this tremendous challenge related to climate change, where they are. They are in a fact that the business models we have, financial models we have, and the way how we place money, invest money, and also manage money are not based on the foundations of sustainability. For the very short-sighted reason that is embedded in the way how we run our economies, going back to the Chinese Prime Minister, we are very, very short-sighted. And the reason for that is that we have not 
truly started looking at the way how we can reshift and rebalance the economic model we have. And we can do that. It's possible to do it, but it's going to cost. Shall we look at some more numbers? It was mentioned earlier, financial industry. We have known this for such a long time. Yes, we have. Have we acted on it? Do you know how much money is managed in the world today? Totally, all the capital in the world. $100 trillion. And how much of that money is invested in a sustainable way? Any bidding? No? 14 trillion in Europe, and if you add some of the investments in other countries, in US and maybe some of the investments in Japan, you end up to approximately maybe 22, 23, depending on how you count. So every day, while we sit here, talk about sustainability, Iceland, companies, Sweden, Norway, all of these things, we are recycling, driving bicycles, doing all of these fantastic things. Our pension money, your pension money, is invested in a different direction. So while you're recycling, while you're eating ecological bananas, listening to Greta and not taking the plane but doing train, your pension money is invested in companies that are actually contributing to creating the problem every day. How can we change that? That's the biggest challenge financial industry have. And when I talk about the cloud of climate, looking beyond the cloud, when you look at the storms, then you start thinking about 54 million climate refugees anticipated to enter or try to enter Europe next 25 years. Then you think about 2 billion, approximately, people on this planet living under $2 a day about their perspective on growth. How are we going to manage income inequality that is creating such a huge challenge for us to make the shift? In the bank that I work, and in the work that I've done over the years, we've done some interesting calculations. You can find them. They're actually public. I posted them on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and people are reading them. 300 people in the world today, the most wealthiest people on this planet, can rebalance 26% of the capital to finance complete transition to a climate neutral future. That's the amount of money that we need to make that transition. So why is it so difficult? Why is it so hard? Is it because we are not getting this feeling of what are we fighting for? What is the sort of a, the core thing of what we are fighting for? The core thing is for us in the West world, and I'm sorry to say that, when we talk about sustainability, when we talk about we, we talk about climate, my friends, this is the way of, for us to protect our livelihoods for the next 50, 100 years, because it's not going to be easy. Given the growth, we're becoming older, the growth is taking place somewhere else, both when it comes to the population and economy, there will be three centers of the world that will basically fight with each other for various types of influence, and power, and resources. We're going to have US, Americas, Middle Earth, Iran, and Russia, and we're going to have Asia. That's where it's going to happen. So the way how we are going to perceive and pursue this in terms of sustainable investment and sustainable finance, this is the only way for us, actually, to make that transition possible so we can protect the assets we have, but also protect the growth that we need. When I started 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, people were calling sustainable investments, responsible investments, stupid, naive, religious, you know, all of these nice things. But now, today, you can read it on a Bloomberg. The mutual 10 biggest mutual funds in the world that are sustainable have beaten market, markets last couple of years quite a lot. Sustainability is actually very profitable, but it's not profitable per definition. It needs to be done in a very interesting way. A very interesting way is looking at the companies in these big changes that we have, demographic changes, urbanization changes, we have digitalization, we have changes in, in, in populations in various parts of the world, how to identify companies that have sustainable business models. And I'll tell you a short secret. I did a big project last two months, I was looking at the way how I, in my work, this is my job. My job is to develop sustainable products for tomorrow. So climate, just transition, how do we find these best companies in the world? And we looked at Europe, 3,000 stock-listed companies. We wanted to invest in most climate-adjusted companies in Europe. 
the ones that will lead a change, that will transform our economies, that will provide the leadership and give us the money that we need so we can reinvest and create even bigger growth. 3,000 companies, took us two months. Quant analysts, normal financial analysts, people looking at all kinds of numbers. Do you know how many companies in Europe we have that are on path to, Par to reach Paris target? Come on, we do the bidding again. Anybody up there? No? 117. That's what we have. We haven't looked at the US, in Asia, but in Europe, there are only 117 companies that have a trajectory path to reach Paris target agreements in the way how they emit emissions in their own business. And the pink elephant in the room is the scope three emissions, which are the ones that are most interesting for you if you're an investor, because that's where the products and services are. And that data is today not even available. In the cases it's available, it's not verified, it's very difficult for us to use that data in a way how we build our models. So if you look at the way how the sort of a transition from sustainable investments, where does it lead? We have started from the low ground. There's a lot of things that has happened over the last five, six years. I would say over the last three years. Um, basically, everybody's running into this space. Everybody's doing sustainable investments, which is fantastic. This is exactly what we need. You can hear the system cracking. Now we're on our way to crack it. But in order to do that, we really need to develop tools that are truly looking at the corporations from the angle of not only their values, but actually from the value of their products and services. So a company that has great values, but crap product and services is barely sustainable. And if we in Europe have 117, and we are the most developed part of the world when it comes to these kind of data, then you can imagine how it looks in other parts of the world. So the big question is, what is going to happen for the next five, six, ten years? And my sort of a take on that is that the climate, we won't be able to solve many of these things on the climate change. Transition in these industries, you have seen the graphs. It's like saying, you know, I don't know, somebody was showing this very steep graph, you know, from 20, we need to take it down so much to zero. Who's going to take the cost? Who's going to pay the taxes? Which one of us will take that as a sort of, a, okay, but this is what we need to do, and we can do it together, of course we can, but I think we need to start reevaluating the business models in a way that we don't do today. That's the future thing. What's the societal contract of business with the future, with the communities where they operate? Can they deliver their products and services to a greater generation? Are they able to do that? That's the question they need to ask themselves. How can they provide profit and growth over the time that has a benefit to society? These are the questions that CEOs around the world that I meet and I speak, this is the something they ask themselves. What is the social value of my enterprise? How do I create the growth that contributes to other things? People are talking about universal basic income, all of these things, because we are in a place in the world where the income disparity and the power struggle has just started. And it's on a level that we, we, we can't even sort of grasp that, because we live in a technocratic democracies that we've been running over the last 40, 50 years, and now we enter into, into a new, completely new stage. We have a climate issues, we have symmetric issues related to income disparity, we have many other things, so we need to go back into the looking at the how do we develop current economic model to serve the purpose that is outlined in the film. I'm sure we can do it, we can do it together, but what is really, really important is that we need to start looking at the elephant in the room and start to buy shoes that are the size that we actually need. And not the two sides shorter that we have today. You can't, we can't push climate into climate solutions, into economic models that are not sustainable. It doesn't work. Because we are fooling ourselves. So that's the something that I strongly believe will change for the next couple of years. In my work, in what I do, I'm trying to find a way all over the world. We are investing listed equity, private equity, 150 billion euros. I'm trying together with my colleagues to look at the business, not only from the angle how they tackle climate change. It is the most imminent threat. But we have to see beyond that. The climate change is a consequence of something. We need to understand how these consequences work. Financial industry, 
is key in transforming that. Transforming that amount of money that we need for the next 10 years will be crucial to meet the targets that are set in Paris. Do you know one funny thing? During the, I was in Paris and Copenhagen and Katowice and all of these places as observer during the UN negotiations. There's one sector that was never consulted during these negotiations, especially in Paris. And which sector was that? Financial industry. Does financial sector have any CO2 emission targets? Nope. Do we have a globally accepted CO2 emission number to cost? Nope. As long as we don't have that, we need to find a way how to price what is good and also penalize what is not good. Coal, just to give you a thing on coal, we in Europe, I have eight seconds left, so it's just eight seconds between the drinks. <laughs> coal, yes, in Europe we have decreased the dependency on coal, which is fantastic, good for us, good, good air, fantastic life quality and all of that. But in China, in Asia, They've increased 80% last 12 years. Why? Because they have access to it. They need to grow. They need to feed their population. This is something that we are so forgetting in the equation. We think about we. It's, yes, it's us. We. We. Who is we? Talk to the Chinese, Indian, Indonesian business leaders. Talk to them about the growth and the way how that climate change needs to be tackled. You will get a completely different story and the different circumstances they are in that need to transform their population in order to be able to buy things that we buy today. So, to conclude that, and conclude this uh, short speech about how the things look in the world and the role of the financial industry, I would like you to close your eyes for 30 seconds and think about what is the most important thing in your life. Most of the people have that, it sort of sits in the back of your, in the middle of your back. So, tell me, how many of you th were thinking about money? Don't look at me, look at each other. <coughs> Let's be brave. We can solve this. Thank you. <laughs>